Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is David Weinberger, a research fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School and the author most recently of Everything is Miscellaneous, The Power of the New Digital Disorder. David, welcome to Econ Talk. Hi. Now, Everything is Miscellaneous is the story of how we organize digital information or fail to organize it, how we customize information and how the digital information universe is changing the way we think and organize our thoughts. It's full of insights and trivia and charm. You, you open the book with the story of a Staples store that's actually a laboratory that Staples uses to make their stores better. And that laboratory store is a highly ordered physical space. Tell us the challenges that Staples faces and why those challenges of the physical world don't operate all the time in the digital world. Staples is trying to be a, a good actor here. Usually, the, the science of merchandising, of laying out a retail store, is the science of using space against customers. So they typically will put the most popular item in the back of the store in order to force you to go to the end of the store so that you'll pass by all the delightful offers. And so your efforts are being thwarted, space is being used against you. Staples is trying not to do that. It's trying to act more like a website, although they don't quite put it that way. But uh, at a website, if uh, they keep throwing up obstacles to getting what you want, you'll you'll leave, whether it's a pop-up or badly organized information or you're looking for for a printer, but first they make sure that you see all of the specials on scissors and paper. I mean, that's not a well-organized website. So Staples is, is trying to make its physical stores operate the way the web does, but there are limitations. So there's just so much they can do. So they're doing the best they can. They're being quite progressive. Nevertheless, there are lots and lots of places you would want to put CDs. That is, if the people who are looking for, uh, who are about to buy a computer, maybe they want to buy some blank CDs. And the people who are buying a, a, a CD player, maybe they do, or buy the music or the software, or there's just lots of places where you could you could imagine a customer who's buying one thing or looking for one thing would also be interested in CDs, but you cannot put them everywhere because there's very limited space shelf, uh, shelf space, and the uh, the stocking issues would be horrendous. So, and likewise for cables and, and lots and Paper, lots of other all things. The things that, a lot of the popular items is the, is the irony. You, you, you'd want, you want to have... You almost want to have an area of the store where where you can go or where you where you could say, this is where you probably want to buy something that you probably came here for. Which of course they do have stuff like that. They have end caps and they have uh, stuff by the cash register that are, that tend to be frequent purchases. But in general, they can't put everything there that they'd like. No, you, you simply can't um, because the way the physical world works is you, things have to go in one one spot. Furthermore, the information that they provide uh, in the store is more than many stores do which is quite on purpose, but not nearly as much as you would get on the web where you could put up uh, some, of, some of the specs for a printer, let's say, as you're looking uh, online for a printer, but you let your users click and they get the rest of the information or they get taken somewhere else. They get a full page and that page is linked and so forth. So there's no end to the amount of information online, including information outside of the particular online site. In the store, if you put all that information there, you'd obscure the items on the shelves. Um, it, it's just the print can only get so small. Um, so the retail store, the physical store, even when it's trying to do the best job that it can, as Staples is, to be customer friendly and to provide as much information and make things as convenient as possible to get you in and in and out as quickly as possible, which typically is not what stores are trying to do. Um, even with a, a store that's trying to be a good actor, that just the limitations of the physical are just there. And there's nothing you can do about it. Well, I have to disagree with you a little bit about the Staples being such an outlier. I think competition in general, and particularly Internet competition, has forced retailers to be as customer-friendly as they can be because they have so many choices. Well, uh, I, I, I'm sorry to say that I don't see a lot of that, actually. Um, well, I think uh, Walgreens, for example, I think they were very – 
active early on in their uh, resurgence and putting stuff near the front to make it easier for consumers to find their stuff. I don't know. I'd be interested. It'd be interesting to look at empirically whether that's that model that you talked about of making the customers walk through the store is is really uh, how common it is. But it, it is a it is a um, something you hear. I just don't know what. It, what well, there's it's. a book by Paco Underhill that is about this, and it does vary by by genre. So. Uh, Stores that depend more upon your browsing will um, make it more difficult to get out. Hmm, interesting. I wonder how much competition, though, plays a role in, in restraining them from, from that. Because uh, time's valuable. People don't uh, – people choose their, their stores to some extent on how long it takes to get to stuff. So, And especially with the web, which I think has made it much, much um, diff, much more difficult to, to take advantage of consumers uh, – because of the alternatives they face. But going, going back to Staples, I, the signage issue, which fascinated me of, of what you see when you walk in the store and look around, the, the physical limitations of our height and where, what you can see as you walk in, you had some interesting stuff on that. Do you remember it? Well, I, it, it's, it, it's just also obvious. I'm, I'm glad it's interesting, but in another sense, it's completely obvious. I mean, they, the uh, store would stack. The stores tend to be quite tall, high ceilings. But the shelving doesn't go all the way up because they want you to be able to see over the shelving to see what's beyond it so you can get an informational view of the information in, in, in the layout itself. So it's pegged to uh, average height of, of a human. And the shelves are not 15 feet tall and they're not 3 feet tall. Uh, of course, average height of a human um, raises issues if, for example, you're in a wheelchair. But that's, you know, um, they, the store does the best it can with the, with the law of averages. Sure. So. But the digital world is different. The digital world has the opportunity to put more than uh, to put something in more than one place at the same time, which is really one of the beautiful. Uh, it's obvious, but the way you talk about it in the book is really quite quite extraordinary and quite fascinating. Uh, you talk about three different types of order: the way we try to organize information and and our knowledge about various things. What are those three types? The, the first is the order uh, is the way that we organize physical things themselves. So you put the books on the shelves, you put the uh, photos into albums. It, you get to do one type of organization um, because everything has to be someplace, and it can only be one place at a time. That's sort of the basics of the physical world. So, in the second order, we have learned we learned early on, probably around the Sumerians, to separate the information about the stuff um, or the metadata, physically separate it and organize that. And the uh, canonical example is a library card catalog, um, in including, by the way, um, the online representative, sorry, the, the computer-based representations of them, at least up through recently, where they were simply um, uh, simulations of physical cards. Frequently. Right, yeah. Putting the catalog online meant Scanning the cards, which was a rather unimaginative and, and bad use of, of the computer's ability. Yeah, or even retyping the cards. Um, <laughs> yeah, even better. Um, which, when I, actually, when I was in, graduated college in 72, and while I was there, um, we earned extra money from the library uh, by typing in the cards. It was one of the first computerized systems. <laughs> so uh, libraries have been doing this for quite a while. But anyway, so the second order, the... Uh, you separate the metadata that almost always means that you greatly reduce the amount of information that's available. So in the case of a card catalog, you have all of the information in the book, and in, you, in the second, which is the first order, in the second order of order, you get just a three-by-five card. Uh, and there's a science to figuring out which information uh, makes it into the condensation on the card. And because the card is small, you get to organize it in maybe three or four different ways by author, subject, and title, and you know, maybe five or six, but not much more than that because then the cards become unusable, the catalog becomes unusable. So that's the second order, and has great advantages. It's um, much easier to find information, uh, and you get the multiple sorts. In the third order, everything is digital. The contents, the information about the contents, everything is online, and that means that the limitations that we took for granted that uh, we actually have thought were limitations or, or were the shape of knowledge itself, those limitations just go away and we get to invent new principles. And what are some of those that we've taken advantage of in the evolution of the Internet so far? Uh, 
some of those which- principles. How you you talk, for example, about uh, information as being the leaves on a tree, and that we can assemble those leaves in so many different ways. Obviously, you could take a card catalog and and shuffle it um, in different ways, and and people do that with. Uh, quotes and they do it with anecdotes and stories and when they're preparing a lecture or they might reshuffle their their physical second order uh, summary of things and i have to digress for a minute one of the, the coolest things in the book that I, uh not very important but but i loved it was the that melvin melville dewey the founder of the dewey decimal system uh, not only was interested in the library catalog, but also in uh, spelling, uh, phonetic spelling, and the metric system, and that he considered changing his last name to D-U-I, Dewey, a phonetic spelling, shorter, more efficient, uh, and ironically, of course, would have, uh, in modern times, be related to drinking under the inf- driving under the influence. Which I found rather yeah, he amazing. actually did change his name to Dewey for quite a while. When he became the librarian at Columbia University, he changed it back, and his, he continued to spell his first name in a spelling simplification way. He, he was he was close to being an insane rationalist. Uh-huh. Um, Obsessively uh, efficient. Obsessed yes. with efficiency. Yeah, super rational. And not insane in, in, in ways that would have gotten him uh, institutionalized by any means. I mean, he was functional, but uh, the degree to which he believed in the power of rationality was... Um, in one sense, Looney, and another, uh, just a really good example of a 19th century set of beliefs. Well, let, let's stick with him for a minute, actually. There is a certain um, romance we have about taxonomy and categorization and, and filing and order, that there is a certain right way to file things. In the Dewey Decimal System, I'm sure Mr. Dewey was rather um, – uh, was a, a strong advocate for his particular method, and it has survived the test of time with lots of um, emendations that you talk about in the book, but it's still one way of organizing our our books. And it's not, not only is it not the only way, it's, it's not the only way that's best for all kinds of different purposes and different people and different cultures. And I think it's, it's an extraordinary thing. And what I like about the, um, the evolution of the internet and what we learn from it is the is the is this realization that our romance with categorization is is slightly misplaced. It's mixed up with a um, a romance, I guess, uh, a deep set of beliefs that the, you know, there is an order to the universe, and we can get it or we can approximate it, um, and that's what makes an order right, as opposed to what seems to be, to me anyway, closer to the truth, which is that the universe has a whole bunch of attributes. Um, Every, every adjective you can think of counts, and many that we can't. And we can cluster, sort, and organize and categorize based upon any set of attributes that matter to us. So the attribute lets us say that these two things are alike in some way. And we do so um, based upon what our interests, needs, and culture are. Nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that every way of categorizing is correct. I mean, um, a... Uh, a marshmallow is not a hammer, and it doesn't matter if you put it in the same category as a hammer. If the category is things you can hammer nails with, then you're just mistaken. Um, if it's things that may be found in a house or things that are made, made by humans, then, yeah, they do belong in the same category. So not all categorizations are true. That would just be a, a silly sort of mistake to make. And we, can, we can still make mistakes in, in our understanding, but there are so many different ways of taking it and how we of taking the world and how we take it seems to depend upon what it is we're trying to do. Um, nothing wrong with that. That's, uh, that. If that's the case, then there are many more ways of, of relating and seeing relationships and understanding um, than a single categorization scheme would have us believe. And the Internet is quite... Uh, quite practical about these things. I mean, there's just so much information on it that we need ways to sort and organize and thinking that there is going to be one centralized real way of organizing uh, it would be ludicrous. I mean, there isn't, there can't be, and if there were, the Internet would be the size of, uh, you know, the, the Smithsonian, which is gigantic for a real-world collection. Um, something like 150 million objects, uh, that's order of magnitude, number anyway. Um, but the internet is 
so 150. I mean, that's like you know, that's that's one person's CD collection at this point. So, uh, which is not inaccurate. That was an exaggeration. Yes, I understand. So, uh, we our sophisticated could, listeners will, will yeah. certainly understand. <laughs> well, I don't. I, yeah. <laughs> so, um, although it just can feel that way sometimes when you look on your hard drive. I know. Uh, certainly, your photo collection, which you talk about. Yeah, and photo collection is, is uh, in some ways a better and a worse example because uh, as we add, as we get further into the digital camera revolution, we're just filling up our hard drives with not only with thousands and thousands of photos, but the, Thousands and thousands of photos that have names like DSC 00123795.jpg. So uh, that, that's a place where you have a particular burning need to figure out how to make sense of it. So the internet uh, is not susceptible to the mistake of thinking that there can be one one way of organizing, or even even certainly not one real way of organizing. I don't even know what that would mean, um, but not even one preferred way. Uh, it is, in fact, what the book refers to, my book refers to as, as miscellaneous, which it, within the book, um, I mean not simply that it's disorganized, uh, but rather it's disorganized, but with so much metadata uh, attached to it, so much information about the information in it, that it's possible for us to pull together organizations of it, sorts and orders and clusters and clumps and... and, and um, on the fly, uh, that suit our interests and our needs. So it's the rich potential for, for order in it that is uh, truly remarkable about the seeming chaos of the Internet. Do you think it's going to change the way we look at the physical world? It's the Staples example. When you t- I'm curious, when you talked to them and brought this perspective about the digital world to them, does that help them think about the physical world? Does it force them to – they obviously are pretty – already pretty on board with the idea that, that there are lots of different ways they can organize their store. There's no one best way. But there and elsewhere, do you think we're going to change the way we look at, at the physical world based on our Internet digital experiences? Yes. Uh, there are places. So retailing is, is one. Um, and that's not to say we're not still going to have places that put a premium on browsing rather than on efficiency of getting you in and out, you know, getting to the checkout as quickly as right. possible. But, you know, there are lots of places, bookstores in particular, places that frequently encourage browsing and put chairs down so you can sit and take as much time as you need. I mean, so we, this is not to say the world suddenly becomes all web-like. Nevertheless, um, you know, the... And I, I think it goes well beyond stores. I mean, you go into a store and the, one of the... If you're sitting online and you're trying to uh, think, well, you know, I could go to I, I could go to the, I don't know, the Home Depot and order some part, find some part, but you know how big that thing is? And it's, I don't even know where they keep this part, because there's lots of things in, the, in a hardware store that it's hard to predict where and, they're going to yeah, be. And it's designed for 17-foot tall people, by the way. Yeah, it, I mean, they, they, gave up the on the, they gave up on the signage. They decided to swap uh, high shelf space and, and, and let you wander around, because they, they they want to have a lot of stuff in there. so Yes, and in some of these stores, uh, um, Home Depot, for example, at least locally, has lots and lots of people in it, so they expect you to ask people where things are. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, Staples, at least as far as I understand it, uh, is very happy to have you find stuff without having to ask right. people. But I, a place like Home Depot, I think they've, they've totally given up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they have a little, they have a numbered sign at the end of these gigantic aisles with uh, a huge category term. So yeah. it's very difficult to find things. So you're online, you think, should I go to Home Depot? Got to get in the car, got to get there, got to wander the aisles, or should I just order online where I can find the thing? It does, it, it adds an element of competition, um, as you say, and will encourage, I think, many types of retail stores to adopt the some of the same principles to try to learn from from the web. But it's not just retail that's at issue here. I think it's the notion of knowledge itself. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I'm sort of hoping that we're not going to go through the, the Pluto issue again in the same way, that we will have learned from the experience of the web. Well, Talk about the Pluto example because I found that very interesting. You'd think that it, uh, most of us uh, – are old enough to think that there are nine planets, and and it's shocking for some of us to think that it's not 
easily to find what a planet is. It's uh, it's a little bit of a of a wake up call. What, yeah, ha- what happened there? Describe well, that, that that experience. There are nine named planets, of course, but. As our telescopes get better, we discover other objects in the solar system that seem to have the essential char- characteristics of a planet, except we've never defined planets. We've only pointed and named. You know, it's, um, they're not, there's no definition of a planet. I, I recently talked with Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist at the Museum of Natural History in New York, and this is, you know, this is what he says, that, that in fact there has never been a definition of planet by which we could say that this or that ice ball should be added or not. So the internet... I think most of us who are not astrophysicists would say, well, it's obvious what a planet is. It goes something that goes around the sun. And what's it made of, and how big is it? Right, which, of course, there's a lot of things going around the sun. There are a lot of things (laughs) going around the sun, so... Um, so it's big. We it's know pretty big. Big, it's pretty big. It's pretty big. <laughs> but how big is big? And if you make it uh, a reasonable size so that it, you get all of the planets that we currently have, you end up with somewhere around 900 planets, according to one of the uh, scientists on one of the committees that the Inter- International Astronomical Union set up a few years ago to study this question. And we don't want 900 planets. The New York Times even had an editorial last year. Uh, about the planet saying, we want the nine. And they all but said, won't somebody think of the children? We don't know how to memorize the nine. And we've got mnemonics for it. But as the same scientist, not not Tyson, but somebody who was actually on the committee, um, told me when I was researching the book, he said, you know, how many mountains are there? We don't know. And what's the exact definition of a mountain? I mean, we don't know. But nobody says, geez, we've got to have just nine mountains so the kids can remember them. It should be the same thing for the planets. So the, the IAU, the Astronomical Union, tried to figure out what the definition of the planets were. Um, and they had a couple committees, and they uh, basically they couldn't come to agreement. They, the, the union rejected those and put it to a, a majority vote of scientists at a meeting in Prague last summer, which by itself tells you something. Right? Um, and so they came up with two criteria for planets. The first is that it's an object big enough that it rounds itself through the action of gravity. Because we know planets are big, but you don't want to say something arbitrary like as big as Mercury, because there's no science there. So instead, they came up with this physical principle. And the second is that it clears the space around it. Why do we care about that? What's interesting about the fact that whatever even that means, (laughs) it it doesn't matter. That was put in order to get the nine planets back. And in fact, we only got eight of them. Right, so the best they could do in coming up with criteria to rule out the other, you know, however many you want to count, say 900 other plausible objects of some size. They, they came up with those two rules so it's simply clearly... in order to get the nine back. There is nothing scientifically interesting about either of those properties of objects, that it's round or that it clears the space. Is as Pluto Tyson, not round, though? Or is it, does, does Pluto not clear its space, or is it not round? Which one rules it out? Uh, do you know? I don't know which one actually. Okay, but Pluto doesn't pass those two tests, or we're stuck with eight. Is that is that the bottom that line? That is correct. Yeah. What was that other thing they found that was like three times as far from? Uh, oh, there's uh, there's a bunch. Zena is one of them. Zena, the warrior yeah. planet. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> the guy has found a couple of them. They're way they're way distant, but they circle the sun. You know, you could have said that it has to be within uh, within a certain right. radius of the sun, but that w- and and that would work except. It, it says it's it's not scientific sounding, but it's rounds itself sounds yeah. scientific. But there's nothing of scientific interest about that. And the point that Tyson Neil deGrasse Tyson makes is, by the way, the Museum of Natural History no longer clusters by by planet. They cluster by things like by interesting properties like objects in our solar system that are rocky and have water. Because water is really interesting if you're yeah. interested in biology, possibility of, of life, or uh, objects that have atmospheres, and there's a handful of those, or objects that are hurtling towards us is an interesting category. So in my terminology, the, the solar system is incredibly miscellaneous. There are all these different types of properties we could choose to be interested in. Some are scientifically interesting. Many are not, you know, shiny objects, you know, uh, or lights we can see in the sky, eh, sort of, I mean, they're interesting, but it doesn't, obviously, doesn't come down to planets. Um, and there are planets that are too far away for the naked eye to see, so we don't see the lights in the sky. Um, 
there's all these different properties. It's very useful to science to be able to cluster and slice and dice along whatever properties are relevant. If you're interested in life in the solar system, then water really becomes interesting. If you're interested in in mining the asteroids or whatever, then presence of copper becomes interesting. But to say that there is only one way that the solar system is ordered or one real way that it's ordered, that's what's where's the science there? That's a, that's a diminution of meaning and information and significance. But that's what we've been doing, not just with the solar system, but overall in insisting that there has to be a single way that the world is. Yeah, we like to put things in boxes, unless you're talking about my house, in which case I like to keep things on the floor or on the shelf or wandering, wandering around. But we, we like to put things in intellectual boxes, uh, and we like to think those are the boxes, the names we put on the boxes are the right ones. And as soon as you start thinking about the fact that more than one thing can go in more than one box and more than one – and a thing can go in more than one box at the same time, it forces you to think that that box thing is the wrong metaphor. Well, it is, it is the wrong metaphor, although obviously it gets it's something, something that's right, right which it has is some value. It's not things useless. do cluster. Yeah. And we cannot avoid clustering them. We seem to be wired to do so. There's no possibility of language without saying that these two things, even though they're different in many ways, whatever the two things are, nevertheless are covered by the same word. We can't learn unless we're able to see that this green plant that I ate and made me sick is the same as that other green plant is likely to have the same effect. I mean, there's a survival skill um, that explains why it is a our brain clusters and associates, but the box metaphor implies that uh, um, that there is one way of doing it, that when it's in one box, it's not in another box, and that that type of simplification works on sort of case by case when you're trying to think things through, but as a, I don't know, as a metaphysics, it's screwy. It's incredibly limiting. Mm-hmm. No, it's really, uh, it's a cool thing. One of the issues that comes up in in uh, in economics that, that I've been thinking about lately is you know, is every transaction unique? Well, sure it is. Every transaction has its own peculiar aspects, whether it's the quality of the good or the things that come with it or the buyer's quirky tastes or the seller's personality or the service that you get if you buy it. And so in one dimension, every transaction is unique, but in another tr- dimension, transactions take place in a market and compete closely or perhaps not closely with certain other transactions. And those are – that's – as soon as you get to that world, you're in a world of art rather than pure science. So, you know, if you talk about the market for cars or the market for uh, books or other things, we use those terms as economists very loosely, but uh, they're loose terms. There, there's no official market for those things. Uh, there's physical markets that we often invoke, like a farmer's market or the New York Stock Exchange, but the markets that economists find most interesting, which are the markets of transactions that are linked by the fact that they compete with one another, they can't nail those down. And students find that unbelievably frustrating. Um, they want to know the answer. But a lot it's like the planets. Sometimes there's no one answer. You, you well, oh, And as long as, I mean, there, so the old, I don't know, the sort of knee-jerk response to this, is, 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 I think of this sort of college freshman response is to say, well, then there's nothing. Because it's, right. it's yeah. not nailed down in yeah. neat boxes. It's all so made it's, up. Yeah. It's all made up, and it's not. We're just really, I mean, that's that's really missing the human ability to to make sense of the world and to understand, not just that these two things are related or they're, they're each unique, but to understand sort of the metadata about that and to say, well, they're each unique. Nevertheless, when, uh, when looking at masses of them, we can make useful generalizations. Um, it, it, this is... It's not even even uh, well. In the book, I use the example of Hamlet, which happens to be a particularly rich example of this thing that we all know what it is, and it's a real thing. It's a play by Shakespeare, and and to, to deny that would be to just to be foolish. I mean, there is a thing called Hamlet. Nevertheless, the closer you look at it, and if you're a librarian or or um, concerned with with the retrieval of, of books electronically. Uh, or in the real world, you know this for sure. Even though there certainly is a thing called Hamlet, the closer you look, the less hard-edged, the less in a box it is. Which is the thing called Hamlet? I mean, there are three plays, the three editions um, from Shakespeare's time, actually, uh, two of them shortly after he died, um, that 
for are our sources for Hamlet. So right there, you got three. And and if you're a scholar, most of us don't care about that. If you're a scholar of Shakespeare, you care deeply about it. And then past that, you have hundreds, if not thousands, of editions of Hamlet, each of which reasonably can be called Hamlet. But if you're trying to track them, say even in an inventory system, each one of these these editions is is different, sometimes in quite significant ways. Nevertheless. Should we therefore say, well, there's no such thing as Hamlet? No, that would be not just madness, that would be stupidity. Right. We're Take very the, subtle at understanding these things. Right, and the answer that, that I'm tempted to give as an economist is, I, I, a couple come to mind, the answer to the question, what is Hamlet, is whatever is useful to think of as the definition of Hamlet, which is going to be very broad indeed. It, it includes, as you mentioned, the translations. It includes, it perhaps might include things like Rosencrantz and Gilder Gilderstern are dead by Tom Stoppard, which is not by Shakespeare, but clearly is deeply related to Hamlet. Um, it's um, it's a fascinating. Yeah, a fascinating I mean, nobody point. would say that uh, would say that Rosencrantz and Gilderstern are dead is Hamlet. But if you were looking to cluster books, the Hamlet books, they, it would be somewhere on the edges of the cloud as something that that is closely is a derivative work of in many ways. And if um, you were browsing the Hamlet section. Uh, in a physical library, you'd love to stumble on that, and it usually wouldn't get put there because Tom Stoppard is alive and Shakespeare isn't. <laughs> and so the beauty of the digital world, that third level of order that you talk about in the book, is the opportunity to stumble on stuff and browse in a totally different way than you browse in the physical world. And and I just want to – yes, but um, it, that is delightful. Um but it is also, um, it's not just a matter of browsing, though. It's uh, what happens to um, to knowledge and even our sense of what a thing is, whether it's a planet or it's Hamlet. The notion that things have sh have sharp edges or def have definitions that enable us to decide this is Hamlet, that is not Hamlet, is a notion that we get from Aristotle. It has a long pedigree in our history and much of our intellectual life over the past 2,500 years has been trying to figure out what things are by coming up with the clear definition of them. And that's, it, is that essentialism? Is that what you call essentialism? Uh, essentialism actually, yes, is a, is a form of this. Um, that's that gets in the way. Sometimes you absolutely have to do that. You have to decide whether the boat trailer counts as a vehicle or whether the boat or the motor scooter counts as a vehicle because you're the state licensing department and you've got to say yes or no. And so there are times, absolutely, we have to come up with a definition, and we do. We stipulate. There are many times when it's useful, but to think that the world is organized around definitions that pick out a handful of traits, treat some of them as essential, as, as definitive of the object, and uh, at least traditionally, um, therefore, in, in a real sense, more real, the most real part of the object, what you really are. A human really is a rational animal. It is not an animal that happens to have a nose and belly button in front or whatever else you want to say, whose head faces forward. We really, we are that too, but we re or uh, objects whose hair grows uh, indefinitely. Hmm. Yeah, we are that, but that's not what we really are. And essentialism picks out from the definition the the part that is the real part of it. Um, that there, uh, there are uses and times for that. Nevertheless, that gets in the way of thought because Hamlet doesn't have a definition. And by recognizing that, by recognizing that there's a, a set of, of attributes, some of which have to do with author and intent and content and age, you know, the, the, the time that it was written and so forth, um, you get a much messier but more significant understanding of the thing. The, what the web the web is making things complex. Our old temptation has been that to know it is to make it simple, to see the simple definition that's underneath all of the seeming complexity. Well, the web is all about sticking together <laughs> ideas through links of every sort, so that they are infinitely complex and in, infinitely browsable. You're listening to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm talking with David Weinberger about his book, Everything is Miscellaneous. Well, these links that we've been talking about and the ability to browse beyond the shelves that you might be stuck with when you had to define things more sharply, this opportunity to, to have softer edges, 
Do you think it's a cause or an effect? Uh, let me just throw this out to, for you to respond to this is purely speculative. You know, we have claim is our, that the young, gener young people today have very short attention spans. The claim is it comes from watching television, and I don't have any idea if that's true. But I do find in my own experience as a non-young person, I'm 52 years old, and I find the pleasure of leaping from link to link uh, to be very high. I love the idea of wandering through a set of links, and I suspect many people do. I think that has any effect on our um, our thinking patterns, and then, or do you think it's an effect of the fact that we have short attention spans, and it's a response to it, its popularity? Well, those are good questions. I don't have the slightest idea. I'm, I'm not a scientist. Uh, not even a researcher in, in any <laughs> real or statistical sense. So, um, I, you're I can a only philosopher, guess, so. David. You know about this. <laughs> uh, not cause and effect. And I, 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 by the way, I reject the notion that I'm a philosopher. Okay. I'm a writer. Sorry, uh, it's okay. You've studied philosophy at one point in my life. Well, I, I have to mention that that this is, I think, the third podcast where Aristotle's been invoked on Econ Talk. Really? And, uh, He's hot. He's yeah, the Paris yeah. Hilton of the intellect. Exactly. And uh, Podzinger, which we have up on the Econ Talk homepage, would allow you, even though we have not tagged, explicitly tagged, any of the podcasts with Aristotle or essentialism, uh, Podzinger does allow you to pull those disparate leaves together. Podcasts on Econ Talk that mention Aristotle. I think that's... Uh, a kind of a cool thing, and I think yeah. will grow as a as a way of organizing audio, which is a which is a real challenge, by the way. And it, absolutely, and um, the 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 challenge it's facing everybody on the web, but in many ways, the web is the response to this challenge: is to figure out how to um, enable us to make sense of this huge pile of leaves, resources that were were building for ourselves, and that's where a lot of the innovation has been, and uh, we're actually, I think, doing... We're never going to keep up, but that's okay. We just need to be good enough. You have a chapter in the book called Social Knowing, which is about some of the ways that people are organizing... Um, organizing is not the right word. Tagging and, and making it easier to share like stuff. And you also talk about Wikipedia. It's uh, required by law. <laughs> What is required by law? Talking about Wikipedia. Yeah, well, this w this would be more than the first uh, podcast where we've talked about Wikipedia. We've had a set of of recent podcasts where we talked about uh, information and the the wisdom of crowds and collective knowledge. Uh, but I I'd like you to talk about Wikipedia um, and talk about the distinction between information, what we might call facts, and knowledge, which is a much richer and more complicated idea. And how does Wikipedia serve those two? Uh, okay. Um, and then there's this third thing that's understanding that I think is yeah that's uh, a better way to say it yeah well uh, no this, I think it's not better I think it's just, it's different that there are in fact these three things and our culture has been focused on knowledge uh, as the highest of the human activities knowing we are the knowing creatures I mean that's really what it means to be the rational creatures we're capable of of knowledge um, and so we've been focused on that. Uh, at least, you know, philosophers keep telling us that. It's not really clear that anybody is, has believed them, but strong philosophical tradition. And, uh, you know, I don't think, I don't think that's um, really what most of the web is about. I think that's, that's, knowledge is an important thing, and it's a really important thing. Um, we're always going to continue doing it. We're very good at it. We have very sophisticated techniques for everything from peer review to, well, you name it, for figuring out what we know. But it's not the peak experience. I think understanding is actually uh, why we want to know things. So I, I want to maintain those distinctions between facts, knowledge, and um, and understanding. So the, the facts are really uh, difficult to talk about. Um, it's sort of a primitive term, and, and the, the postmodernists get very... Uh, it's a term that's it's hard to talk about without... Uh, invoking postmodernism, which I guess I just did, but now I'm going to try to ignore it. I think it. it's the law. Yeah, it is the law, exactly. <laughs> so now we're done. We've done Aristotle, postmodernism, and, the, and, and Wikipedia, Wikipedia, so yeah, we're in the we're clear. Great. We're done. We're on a roll. Yep. Um, but facts are things like uh, what year was um, Churchill born? Yeah, it's the stuff in the almanac. Um, and they're incredibly useful, but they're commodities. 
Um, in fact, I, and there's a sense in which uh, facts almost always quickly become commodities. That is, you know, it's like <clears throat> like nails. That um, or like, by the way, daily coverage has become for newspapers. Or sort of the, the reporting part of newspapers, to a large degree, has also been commoditized. Uh, it's stuff that it doesn't really matter where you get it. You don't care which edition of the almanac you buy because the facts are the same. You only care about which edition based upon which one organizes the facts better. Um, so facts are commodi- commodities. There are things that we have stopped arguing about generally. Um, if we're still arguing about it, then it's not been established as a fact. And if you look at Wikipedia, they had, a, say, a biography page. There is a, a text, a, a box with just the facts in it, born, what year were you born, and so forth. Works, yeah. Yeah, but, right. With uh, news, and everybody does. Newspapers do that, too. And they, they tend to put it in a box, literally, which is sort of nice, given your previous metaphor, the discussion of the, of the box metaphor. Mm-hmm. Um, but Wikipedia, of course, isn't just facts. It's, it's, not, it's not an almanac. It's about uh, knowledge as well. And so it, it has its its techniques and processes for determining what we know about some topic, and we can argue about whether it's, that's good or bad, whether it works or not, but let's say for the moment it does. And so now you have, um, you have the knowledge that we have settled upon um, because it's been born of, of argument. Right, so the, the discussion pages of Wikipedia will show you those arguments. This is the knowledge that we have agreed upon, and thus, in, in a sense, I think... And I want to be speculative about this, but it seems to me maybe that Wikipedia is commoditizing knowledge. That if you want to know not just the facts, but also what we can think of as knowledge about uh, some broad range of topics, not all of them, you can go to Wikipedia. Um, and that stuff is now publicly available. Anybody can use it. There's no fees. It's, you know, it's in the public domain. Uh, well, it's Creative Commons licensed. Actually, it's not. Um, it's, it, let's just say it's publicly available. I knew what you meant. Uh, I think technically I'm wrong, but... Uh, but it doesn't matter. But, Go ahead. Yeah, right. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's one of those rare times when it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, if that's the case, so you know, think about what Wikipedia will be like in 10 years. Now, there'll still be additions, of course, but the, presumably the growth rate of articles will have slowed down because we've done most of them. So, new, you know, uh, new stuff, new edits, of course, but many of the most difficult, most, most of the articles will be pretty stable at that point, one presumes. Well, you never know, but one presumes that there seems to be that type of uh, curve. Right. And so it becomes a source of commoditized knowledge, which is a good thing. I mean, we commoditize facts into almanacs in, in the middle of the 19th century um, to, in part, so journalists could get on with their real work. And instead of having to track down the basic facts of how many, you know, what the population of Des Moines was or whatever, they would just look it up and do their real work of, of, of making sense of things, of, of writing stories. Well, the same thing happens when we've commoditized knowledge. The, the, Google has obviously has changed the way that we the, the range of stuff that we can now take for granted, get out of the way, and get onto the real work of understanding. So all of this is a benefit for what I think is the the, the real thing that humans want to do, uh, which is to understand their world. And that's more contentious and more arbitrary and may change over time as we gain knowledge. And is multiple in a way that knowledge is not. We do not have a plural for the term knowledge. We assume, have assumed, that there is... Just as with facts, there's a right and a wrong. Uh, you know it or you don't. What you know is right or wrong. Um, and that stuff gets settled. And the settlement of it is showing up in Wikipedia. Um, but understanding is multiple. We, you and I may have gone to the same school, same classes, and know the same things, but we, have, we understand things differently because we're different people. And for all the reasons, uh, cultural and personal and the language we were brought up with, our experiences, um, understanding is multiple. It always will be. There will never be a single understanding of the world. And my evidence for this is all of human history. Um, we're just not going to agree because the world is too hard to understand. It's too much based upon... Um, who we are and what our interests are for us to ever to come come to complete agreement. And we're probably not even approaching it asymptotically in any <laughs> any cheerful. Uh... I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know how you would measure that. I mean, so um, and, and furthermore, there's this other phenomenon, um, which an Italian graduate student 
once pointed out to me. He said, you know, if you're in a bar and you're having a disagreement with someone, and especially if it's two guys, if it's two men involved, you'll fight and you, you'll argue and argue and argue until you either have a fist fight or more likely you just one of you stalks out and you're both muttering under your breath about what a jerk the other one was. I can't believe that he said this or that. And you get, you know, you, but online, so things sort of come to a head, a nasty head, uh, Online, if you have, if somebody sends you an email disagreeing, and you write back, and and, and she writes back, and you write back, and the, most likely, uh, over you know, I don't know, three, four, five exchanges, it'll just sort of peter out. You're not you're not stuck in close quarters with the person who disagrees with you, mm-hmm. and so there's room for disagreement. You say, oh, I can't, you know, geez, I'm never going to get anywhere with this person on this topic, and so somebody who disagrees with you goes off and, and lives their life, uh, which seems to be pretty much what happens. Um, but what we're stuck with, we're not going to convert everybody to our way of thinking. Um, we need to let them think what they're thinking. We just need to stay out of their way insofar as we can. Of course, the problems are where we can't, where there's conflict, and we can't stay out of each other's way. Um, but uh, on the web, it's, it's easier, too, because it's a very big web. But the other cool thing that happens on the web is that sometimes somebody says, you know, you're right. It's just a stranger, just an email correspondence. People, I found people concede things that shock me sometimes uh, that they wouldn't concede in that bar <laughs> with the uh, maybe especially with a crowd gathering. Uh, yeah. so there's some other parts to it. Uh, it, it. Of course, you know, it's impossible to quantify this because with so yeah. much on the web, who knows? But I know exactly the same thing. And what I what I hope is the case is that, and you see this in blogs in particular. You see in Wikipedia also that the that fallibility itself becomes a marker for trust, mm-hmm. uh, which is the opposite of how authority has worked in the real world, at least with the official authority. So official authority is, uh, has trouble admitting error. Uh, they put it on the inside front page of the newspaper in, in smaller print. Very small. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, some are better than others, right? But yeah. they're all, it, it's... It's a matter of shame. They they did wrong. They got it wrong, and now they have to admit. I mean, just the language of it is a language of shame. Whereas Wikipedia will will put up a notice. Um, I, I was just, just saw this the other day at the spread the history of the spreadsheet page, where apparently it's not a very good page. If you if you, um, uh, if you listen, listen to some, and and so. Somebody slapped a um, notice at the top saying the neutrality of this article has been questioned. And there's well, of well course, over... everybody argues about the history of the spreadsheet. You'd expect it to be a contentious. <laughs> Absolutely, this is like the Swiss voting article. It's bizarre. You know, they had a there were edit wars, and they had to freeze it. Well, not yeah. exactly. Nevertheless, it is. You know, there are people who uh, it, it is contentious. Um, people want credit. Uh, Sure. And it's it, uh, again, this is actually one of the questions about, uh, where definition comes back in. And what exactly counts as a spreadsheet, and thus who gets credit for doing the first one? I think it was Leibniz, actually. Li- absolutely, <laughs> yeah. The first person who arranged things in two dimensions. Yeah. Anyway, well, so... He needs some credit after his other uh, loss on the calculus. I thought I'd just boost his, his stock. Uh, no, uh, t- Leibniz is becoming very in. Is he? Yeah, he is, actually, okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, Carry on, sorry. So... Um, so there are well over 100 of these different types of notices you can slap on a Wikipedia article. Mm-hmm. Uh, neutrality or accuracy has been disputed or needs more citations. Um, sounds too much like an advertisement. Sounds too much like a sermon. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you don't like any of those, you can make up your own because it's Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is, encourages you to put in this bit of metadata saying this article isn't yet right or isn't yet trustworthy and the sort of paradoxical effect, it's a cheap paradox or what the hell, uh, is that Wikipedia becomes more credible because it's admitting its fallibility. Very simply, that tells us that Wikipedia is on our side. It's not interested in being an authority or looking authoritative so it can sell ad space. It doesn't sell ads. It's interested in helping us make a judgment about what the truth is. Well, it's so cool because there there is no us and them. We're uh, it's us anyway. Yeah, no, it's, uh, no, I think that's a crucial point. It's uh, one of the most crucial points that very few commercial websites understand. They still give us sites that are that feel like theirs right. when they don't have to. It is possible to do otherwise, and Craigslist and, and even Google um, are evidence of that. Well, I- I'm thinking about my daughter who's an eighth grader and she's you know, she gets on the web to write a paper and she'll ask me whether she can cite Wikipedia and 
I, my, I don't know what her school requires or her te- teacher in a particular class, but I think there's sort of a feeling that Wikipedia, it, it, maybe this is less true now, but a year ago, say, Wikipedia is not a, quote, real encyclopedia. It doesn't have authority for partly because of the reasons we're talking about. It's bottom up. There's no central editor. uh, And therefore, it's not as reliable. But you refer, and we've talked about it before on the podcast uh, before, uh, you refer to the study that was done in Nature of the accuracy of, of Wikipedia and the Encyclopedia Britannica. And I thought about it in a new way from our conversation today. That study found, well, there's some mistakes. They took a bunch of scientific issues and they 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 blindly shared them with other scientists and asked them to rank the reliability of these two different encyclopedia entries. And both of them had errors, but they were of a similar order of magnitude. And those of us who like Wikipedia trumpeted it as, hey, look at this. It's pretty accurate. But what's more interesting now that now that we're talking about it to me is the response of the two organizations, which you mentioned in the book. The Encyclopedia Encyclopedia Britannica wrote an extraordinarily long defense of why everything that was claimed to be wrong with its articles was either trivial or really right anyway. And the Wikipedia folks just changed changed the articles. (laughs) Yeah. Because they didn't have anything at stake. They changed most of them in a day and all of them in in, from like 30 days. And some of them are hard to change. It's very hard to figure out whether Mendeleev was the 17th or 14th uh, child in his family. Apparently, yeah. that was a tough one. Or, yeah, you know, something like that. <laughs> you know? And it's not very important. And, and also, it's not very important. There, there were some big errors in both cases. Um, so, it's fallible. And furthermore, you know, the, the nature study is difficult. Um, it's it's controversial and it should yeah, I'm be. Not, I'm not uh, sure it's reliable. It's provocative. It's provocative. Uh, and it was in science where Wikipedia does better. So you could have picked the humanities, in which where. Wikipedia is not particularly strong. Well, neither is Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, when I read the Britannica's uh, essays on various economists, and I'm sure this is true of anyone's specialty, you kind of cringe because it doesn't include stuff that you think are imp- it's important, and it also includes stuff you think is either wrong or misstated or confusing. And and the key point, which again I'm I'm learning from the conversation, is it's the understanding that matters. You you don't go to an encyclopedia f- for facts. We used to, right? That was really important. You'd have to, you know, you found out what the capital of Italy was. You'd go to the encyclopedia. And now you go to Google for that. Now you go to Google in a second. Uh, and you go to an encyclopedia, you should. What it's for is, is, is knowledge at a minimum, understanding at its best. And the elusiveness of understanding is such that, that you wouldn't want to go to an encyclopedia for understanding. Say to look at, let's take a relatively uncontroversial uh, dead issue. What was the cause of the Civil War? Well, it's not a dead issue. People care about it a lot. They're passionate about it. And I'm sure anybody who's passionate about it doesn't like what the Encyclopedia Britannica says about it. Whereas in Wikipedia, you can get the full flavor and that's the, uh, of the different opinions. And that's the source of understanding because it's not a fact and it's not even knowledge. So Wikipedia will say uh, some people believe or there's a school of thought that claims. Yeah. And they're very free to do that. There's also I, there's so many differences. I mean, for one thing um, – the Britannica is 32 volumes. Um, it's the, on, the print one is 65,000 topics, and that means that over time, the existing contents get shorter. So you can you can watch the Oliver Goldsmith article get reduced and reduced in, in edition after edition because they got to cut something. And right. so he's become less important to us, and so his, his, his less information. That's just the nature of finitude, you know, the real world. Whereas Wikipedia, presumably, the articles would just keep getting basically longer and longer. Uh, furthermore, um, Britannica tries to tell you everything about a topic in that topic, um, because it more or less has to. I mean, it has see alsos at the end, but it, they're difficult. You've got to pull down another volume and look it up, and, you know, it's just sort of pain in the neck. So they have large articles that try to cover, uh, be comprehensive, whereas Wikipedia likes shorter articles, in part because of difficulty of reading online. Uh, for, but for whatever reason, their notion of a topic is very different. The notion of a topic is much more like a topic is a web and every article has, like every other word in Wikipedia, is linked. Sometimes, in, in, you know, you look at it and you think, this, they can't really be an article on every year, but there is. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least a, something that pulls together all the links to that year. So its idea of a topic is 
much looser edged. It's much more uh, about uh, breaking, uh, giving you a, a relatively short um, bit of information and letting you now browse to your further interest. It's a different idea about how how knowledge goes together. Yeah, it's, um, it's very, very interesting. Uh, you argue in the chapter called Social Knowing that students today learn in a social way. They email each other as they're reading stuff. They IM each other. They study together. And certainly when I was in graduate school, my study group was the place I learned the most, uh, not, not the classroom. It's where we argued among ourselves about what the classroom meant, and that's where the most learning took place, and I still encourage my students to learn in groups. And you write that, that when this generation grows up to become teachers, quote, they won't be administering tests to students sitting in a neat grid of separated desks. I, I suspect they will, unfortunately. Um, it seems to me that education, like many institutions, is fighting the miscellaneous and in our increased power to organize it the way we like. I'd be curious what you think is going to happen in those types of areas where there is, I think there's, you're right, there's pressure to change the way we learn and the way we think, but the institutions that we have are not quite as flexible as the web and are going to fight back. Well, so that's why I put it in terms of a generational shift, but I, you're, I agree with you. I have no confidence that it's going to get much better. Right now, it's getting worse and worse. From my point of view, it's getting worse and worse. So the increased emphasis on measurement, testing and measurement, is... Uh, um, it's anti-understanding by definition, almost. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's anti-social learning because you have to test them individually. So it's you know it's it's more preparing children to sit in a corner, basically an intellectual corner, and and take a test. So we are. At, this is one of the places where the the fault line is is I don't know widest or deepest or something. Um, and it's it's very disturbing to me, and I don't really know how it's going to turn out. Um, Nevertheless, and as, and as you say about your graduate school experience, and we've been learning socially forever. It's, we do that all the time. It's one of the reasons we. I mean, if you can list the the institutions and organizations we have that we participate in voluntarily uh, to engage in social learning. I mean, everything from book clubs to informal conversations around. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's something we love doing. It's just the educational system has been generally, generally, um, read the text at home, come in and and talk about it. So there's a social element there, although depending on how the class is run, that may be strong or weak, and then and get tested on it individually. Um, meanwhile, the, uh, now our children are, if you're in a community of any affluence, they're doing their homework on the computer, online, so they're doing the IM and the, and the uh, text messaging. Generally not using email, by the way, that seems to be for old people like you and me. Um, Alas. <laughs> yeah, but so they're doing their homework online, and they're talking with four or five friends about all sorts of stuff, including the homework. Uh, you know, what did you get for number six, and why did the teacher ask about the causes of uh, the economic causes of the Civil War? Because the economy has to do with money, and nobody paid to start it, and somebody else is explaining. And so they, they are doing their homework socially, um, but then they're turning it in, and they're getting graded individually. And for myself, for, you know, having put three kids, we still have a kid in the public schools here. Um, I want them learning socially because that's what they're going to be doing forever. Uh, it's, they're not going to be sitting in a corner trying to figure out what the world is like. They're going to be out in the world talking with other people, um, experiencing it together and, and trying to make sense of it together. And that's exactly what we want. There's something really wrong with with where the testing regime is is, is shoving education. Oh, and there's also the, the discipline silos that uh, I talked about recently in a podcast with Dan Pink. Uh, we love to talk about the interdisciplinary nature of, of learning, yet most of us are specialized and not very capable of being interdisciplinary, and so we're not very capable of teaching in an interdisciplinary fashion. And so students are stuck learning uh, a, within a particular discipline, whereas, as, as you point out on the web, the connections to things that are not obviously related but in fact are is what makes learning so glorious and serendipitous and delightful. And our education system isn't particularly good at that. I'd say it's lousy at it. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't homeschool my kids. It sounds like you haven't either. But homeschooling, at least in theory, imaginably would allow 
and a, a different kind of school would allow kids to learn in the more interconnected and social way, be a little bit harder perhaps, the social part of it in homeschooling, but at least the interconnected of idea way that, that, that our current system doesn't particularly enhance. Well, at the very least, it should one think it gives you the opportunity to do the thing that um, the fundamental thing that I, I want actually the schools to do for my children, and which it has succeeded at only uh, intermittently, which is to make children curious about the world, yeah. and then help them figure out how to sate that curiosity. But you know, I, I've watched three of our children, or three children, uh, learn to hate history yeah. by taking it in the school, and these are good schools. You, um, but the need to be tested on it means that, I mean, history, I mean, of all the things to, to find uninteresting. Yeah, how do you make it boring? Well, you can. <laughs> it's actually really easy to make it boring. Well, it's the same way with economics. I find it deeply depressing that uh, I think econ economics has been made less interesting because of the, the necessity of giving exam questions about it, and especially exam questions that large classes can take and then be graded fairly quickly, which puts a premium on multiple choice exams. The yeah. interesting questions of economics are puzzles and and the connections we're talking about between different economic phenomena, and um, testing is hard to do that with. And it's a uh, I think uh, it's hampered our discipline and the appeal it has tremendously. And it's a shame. It's yes. a terrible shame. Uh, it is, and especially since one of the great lessons of the web is that the world is way more interesting than the traditional media. And I'm sorry to say. Um, these days, education, the education system all too often uh, tells us it is. <laughs> it's way more interesting. Yeah. I, I, do, I, do want, I want to say a word for discipline so on, on behalf of discipline, by the way. Um, it obviously would be a mistake to think the world divides neatly into disciplines, and that's that. And I, I don't think anybody believes that. I mean, that, the interdisciplinary movement explicitly as, as a goal, I mean, that's, what, 40, 50 years old. And so you won't find anybody who thinks, I don't think, that, oh, we would, uh, it divides into these categories and that's that, and there's no, you know, everybody knows that knowledge transgresses those lines. Um, and it is, of course, a mistake to, to I think, to um, draw those lines uh, too thickly at, um, at all. But nevertheless, there are distinctions that should be maintained, I think, between the disciplines. And, the, and this is, uh, um, there's a broader point about the miscellaneous here. Uh, if you're taking a science class, studying science, there's a methodology that you need to know that differentiates it from, say, economics. And that's a real differentiation. That's, that's a real line. There is something really different. Even though everything's connected, there are differences that we need to maintain. And so one of, one of the... Um, so the conclusion of thinking that everything is miscellaneous is not, therefore, and I'm not saying you, you're proposing this, by no, the way, but it's, it's not to, to say everything is chaos and there should be no disciplines. And, and everything goes together at the same time. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, I think the real conclusion, the real benefit of it is that we're able to find what the ways of clustering and organizing are that make sense, that actually work, instead of being stuck with um, even good decisions being made by experts uh, for us, that uh, are the decisions that are supposed to apply in all cases, where of course they can't. So it's not to say all of this gets swept away, it's to say, well, no, we get to build now the ones that make sense, and to be able to do so fluidly, so we're not stuck with uh, ways of organizing and disciplines that made sense for one purpose but really don't now for this other purpose. And I also want to, in defense of, of disciplines, specialization is uh, costly, but it's also unbelievably productive. And uh, we talked about this in this uh, the, the Dan Pink podcast. Obviously, you, you don't want to go to a medical specialist who's so specialized – that she doesn't understand that your malady relates to a different malady you have. On the other hand, you don't want to go to somebody who's a generalist and doesn't know enough about tumors if, God forbid, you have a tumor. You, you really want a specialist. So th there are many, many virtues of specialization and, and intense studying of a discipline that, that are obviously important. Uh, absolutely. And in the same way, um, one of the sections of the book uh, argues, uh, argues is a little strong perhaps, but um, asserts that – after, say, 100 years of broadcast, uh, the, that, that being the primary public medium, uh, a medium that 
whose economics uh, favors simplification as a, because it, its economics favors reaching lots of people, so you want the message that, or content that will appear, sure. appear most broadly, that after 100 years of that, one of the ways of explaining the, the irrational exuberance about blogging, which I share, is to say, well, blogging is a way in which we get to complicate the world again. Yeah. We get to talk about what we've seen, say the, the ending of The Sopranos, um, and to find everything that's in it, to point out the details. And so we want to do, but we want to do both things. In teaching in particular, you both simplify and you make more complex. You simplify, then you say, but it's not that simple. Um, we need both. We've just favored one in our, in our media, in our culture. And now we're seeing a dramatic embrace of the other moment. Well, I, I like that. And it, it also, uh, I think I'm, I may be the only person who didn't see The Sopranos last night. Um, I don't think I've ever seen it, actually. Uh, I'm in a very s relatively small group. And The Sopranos is one of those, quote, old-fashioned media events that supposedly we can all talk about. You know, that, that was the old days when we all had, we only had three channels and everybody watched the same thing. I hated that people romanticize that. I, it sounds horrible to me. But people have this romance that we could all talk about it. So what's great about the blogosphere that, that your comment reminds me of is that all of our peculiar weird little interests can also be we, – we, cre we create our own little nations of water cooler conversation around the things that we, that we care about now that we have more choice to care about. And, uh, but every once in a while, an event like the Sopranos or the Super Bowl or something comes along that – that, quote, everybody has seen or heard, and we can still have that national, real national d discussion, uh, which, I, again, I think is, is over, over romanticized. Um, we're almost out of time. I, I want to close with a, with a different area of your expertise that we haven't talked about, which is uh, the effect of the Internet on politics and this miscellaneous information on politics. Um, you self-describe yourself politically as liberal in the book, and politics is an area where I'd like to see much less essentialism. Uh, I sometimes call myself a classical liberal, for lack of a better term, favoring limited government and a larger sphere for voluntary bottom-up solutions to problems that we face. And this increase in bottom-up stuff like Wikipedia and others, uh, all the stuff you talk about in the book, do you think it speaks to the likelihood of, of say, smaller government? Um, Traditionally, liberalism of the modern kind is focused on top-down solutions, more experts, more paternalism, whether it's, whether it's uh, benign or, or, or less so. And uh, do you think that's going to challenge that viewpoint at all? Does it give you any dissonance as, as a policy person? Huh. Um, I don't know. It's easy for me to imagine um, both conservatives and liberals seeing utility in embracing distributed processes, whether, so Homeland Security, for example, which is always going to have a lot of top-down command and control structures in it. It seems to me inevitable. Just, uh, you know, it could be wrong, but I think that's what it seems likely. Um, but somebody could come along and, and create or suggest a system, an alert system, using the Internet in which any citizen can participate, and let's, I'm making this up, so... Um, it, let's imagine that it actually is useful. It's not resulting in every neighbors of every Muslim sending an alert that there are terrorists moving in. You know, let's imagine that it actually works. Or a Katrina-like uh, system, a distributed system of, of information and aid uh, well, the, the, in the Katrina. -like, that's not a, that's not left right. Right. Well, the prediction market idea that Robin Hansen talks about that we've talked about on an earlier podcast is an attempt to get a bottom-up approach towards Homeland Security that you could uh, you could bet on yeah. whether the, the likelihood of a terrorist event. Um, this idea was was quickly dropped for political reasons, I think, mistakenly. But it was an interesting idea, and it's a way to access dispersed information without a top-down approach. It's a cool thing. Or, or Intellipedia, is that the name of it that you yeah. talk about? Yeah, the CIA. Yeah. I mean, Wikipedia, CIA is interesting because here is a place that is has siloing built into its structure. <laughs> yeah. You need to know. So you are actively discouraged. In fact, you can be prosecuted for sharing uh, information. For sharing information. Yeah. Um, so it's totally in the box. And, that, and to its great, uh, I mean, understand the security needs. I cannot 
assess whether those needs are knee-jerk or real. Uh, but certainly the, the CIA would get much smarter if it were just and really quickly if it allowed people to talk about what they know. Sure. Uh, I recognize there's a security risk, but there's also a trade-off. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people in the CIA know this, including the people who are doing Intellipedia. Yeah, I think they're worried about it. I think they, they've come to realize that maybe um, they're not as quite as infallible as they'd hoped. You know, uh, the, the intelligence analysts are... They're basically scholars, right? They're coming out of graduate schools with specialties in, in particular parts of the world. And I don't know that they ever, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've met a few of them, handfuls of them, so it's too easy to generalize. But um, it's, it's really difficult to be put in, in a box, in a cubicle, a literal box, and told um, we need to know what's going on in this, this country yeah. and not be allowed to talk with the country, people who are writing about the neighboring countries. You yeah, know, for sure. So, um, so I, I don't know politically <clears throat> if the if the bottom up stuff is going to be owned by uh, by any one party or side. I mean, there's lots of bottom up grassroots stuff that is completely consonant with with uh, sort of mainstream deep Christianity. Uh, gr- that is, groups who have tended to to uh, be towards the right politically. I don't know that as well as, of course, you know, lefties who believe in collectivism and the rest of that stuff. So I don't know that it's going to separate along those lines. It may be way messier. Well, you're you're the senior internet advisor to to um, to Howard Dean. Uh, is the political campaign of of that's c- about to f- crash on us uh, in the next two years? Or year, Where have you been? It's, we're we're in the middle. We're in the middle. Well, I don't pay much attention to it in the early stages. I find it. Um, you better make up your mind soon. It's a, yeah, election day is approaching. Yeah, you know? I know. It's, I, I find the, the entire process remarkably degrading to, to both sides, the candidates and me. So uh, I try to, to reduce my early. Um, it, 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 it is ridiculous. Well, now on the other hand, you know, I pay attention to spring training because that's important. But um, do you think that the internet's going to play a different role this time around, or just more so? Um, I, uh, not sure how to answer that. Uh, the uh, in in 2004 it was or 2003 it was considered sort of crazy, crazy, crazy Howard Dean to have a blog to give over his the center of his website to a 31 year old guy who just blogged and went off message because the whole point about blogging is to be off message. Yeah. <laughs> um, now you're crazy not to have a blog. It's it, I was at a uh, I was at a conference a couple of days ago where the question was, uh, will the web make a difference? What will the the killer app be for for uh, politics? And I think the answer is, uh, you know, there may not be a new killer app, probably won't be, but the degree to which the Internet has become an accepted part of of politics is, in just a few years is remarkable. It's, it's so accepted that it's pe- people, I think, are missing its near ubiquity in the process. Um, it's near because there's still lots of people who aren't on the Internet, but it's having effects on everything, including our expectations about what information is, is going to be online, being able to get more and more detailed information, but also, and, and the constancy of touch from the candidates, and you can sign up and you can get uh, emails and Twitters and IMs and everything else, uh, but also in the, in the rhetoric of candidates. The, the notion of somebody standing up and giving a thundering oration in classic style, that's, uh, maybe there are some occasions in the campaign where, where they'll do that, but generally the men are taking their ties off. Yeah. This is a very far more informal, far more, the, the rhetoric, the sound of politics has already shifted, and to a large degree I think that's because that type of language just sounds terrible on the web. We're much more used to human voice. Yeah. It may also be, you know, Obama early on, uh, when asked about drug use, said, well, yeah, you know, I used to smoke dope and I've, I've done cocaine. I think he said he's done cocaine. And he's, he's still around as a viable candidate. Our ability to, you know, the web exposes every human foible and we are slowly, but we are getting better at accepting that and, and dealing with it. We live in very interesting times. 
My guest today has been David Weinberger, author of Everything is Miscellaneous. David, thanks for joining us. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.